this is the infamous multi beam and it's actually a, a fairly recent invention. It's an overgrown sonar, and I suppose most of you guys know about sonars already. And basic idea like whales and marine mammals, it's, light doesn't travel very well in water, but sound travels extremely efficiently. And so the basic idea of a sonar, of course, is you put a pulse of sound out, a very short pulse, and you wait to count how many seconds it takes to come back. And typically, people use 1,500 meters per second. This is a very precise sonar, so uh, it act we actually need to know the accurate speed. So the last time they measured it, it was 1,459.6 meters per second. And we'll want to know that number very well because we like to measure things very accurately. So the problem with using a single beam sonar or just a pulse is, um, there's, well, there's a lot of them. You can make the beam really wide, but then you only get an average over a big area. Or you can make it really narrow, and then you only get a tiny spot. And some of the other problems that you're going to face is in synthetic aperture radar, if you guys have done that kind of stuff, you get what's called layover, which means if I do a ping here, I might get a reflection from this before I get it from the floor. And so I think the water is not as deep as it really is. So if you really wanted to measure things very accurately, and, and people do because they want to know what the bottom of the ocean looks like, and that's actually my research. And if you want to know about why this is useful outside of not dropping the fish into the mud on the bottom of the ocean, I'll tell you about that. You would have to, if you had a single beam sonar, you'd have to do a line like this, move over a little bit, come back, do another line like this, and you'd only be measuring a very tiny swath, and it'd take forever. So a while back, like in the 70s, the Navy wanted to do this for various reasons, like they wanted to hide their submarines. They wanted to know where the bad guys were going to hide their submarines. So they came up with a, a better idea for sonar. The basic idea behind this sonar is, if you could, you'd do a whole bunch of beams and you'd measure a swath across the ship. So since the ship's going this way, you'd measure a bunch of, uh, you'd have a bunch of beams transmitting that way. And that's a great idea, except there's lots and lots of technical difficulties. So the first thing that you really want to do is, if you think about it, is uh, a clever way to go, and they do this for weather satellites too, is take advantage of the motion of the platform. So the ship is moving this way. So if you could light up a, a very narrow line across the track of the ship, but very wide, then you can just ping, let the ship move forward a few meters, ping again, and you basically get a nice convenient map. So the question is, how would you do that? And so the basic idea is what they call phased array sonar. And the way a phased array works is if you have two transmitters and you're halfway in between the two, no matter what the waves are doing, they'll constructively interfere. And it doesn't matter how far along that line you are as long as you're exactly in between the two. And that would work if you had two, three, four, five. It doesn't really matter as long as they're equally distant. But what if you wanted to steer the beam a little bit sideways? Fortunately, we have our handy dandy lecture on sonars here. And although it boils down to a lot of math, this is the kind of the key equation is it's basically going to be a sine theta phenomenon because what you're going to worry about is how much extra does the beam have to go from transducer 1 to 2 to 3 and it basically just depends on the angle that you're steering. If you're going to steer the beam off to the side you need a little bit of a phase shift and the key question is uh, sine theta because it's going to be this little extra distance along the beam. So if you could do this, and of course you can back starting in the 70s because that's about the time that people had enough computer power to, to do Fourier transforms in real time. And what you can actually do is you can put a phase between the transducers that are going across the ship and front and back, and we'll talk about why front and back in a minute. And you could actually steer the beam wherever you want it to go. And so that sounds pretty easy. So if you light up a beam across the ship, and then you use this beam steering to figure out what direction it's coming from, it's basically just about like a raster scan and you can figure out how uh, how long it takes from each point on the bottom of the ocean. But there's tons of technical difficulties. And the first one is how do you make that nice narrow beam? Well, there's two kinds, of, there's two phased arrays and one goes along the ship and there's another one that goes sideways. And the way that it works is the one that goes sideways is not the one that lights up the bottom sideways because it's basically like, a, a, I don't know if you guys studied like geometric optics and stuff, you get a diffraction pattern or you get an interference pattern in this case. So what they really do is they light up the bottom with the array of transducers that's going front to back and if you phase things correctly it makes a real narrow sharp beam that goes sideways across the track of the ship. So this is called a Mills cross. So the transmit beam is front and back and the receive beam is sideways. 
and what they're trying to do is basically they'll light up a whole swath and then they'll listen and each beam could in principle you could figure out a little patch as you go sideways well there's lots of computational difficulties uh, so what they really do is they transmit a chirp so that's why if you listen to this thing it sounds like a water drop because to your ear a water drop what it really is doing is going but it's going very fast and that sounds like a water drop because if you ever see a water drop on a slow motion you see why that is so what they're doing is they've got 192 separate uh, transducers are going across the ship and they each one is slightly different in frequency it's basically from 11 kilohertz to roughly 12 kilohertz and they sweep through that and the reason you need to do that is let's say that I ping straight down well, which one is going to get the signal first? You have to have a, a time tag, and the way they do that is they sweep through the frequency. So because they know they transmitted starting at 11 kilohertz and go up to 12, they can figure out which got transmitted first, which is received first. So that, that allows them to sort out the receive. It's basically as if you were coding by time each pixel on the bottom of the ocean that gets lit up. Then there's also lots of mechanical details that require that you have really good servos and GPS because as you can tell especially today the ship's moving around so if I transmit straight down right now the ship could roll forwards or backwards and pitch and yaw and all this and it actually goes up and down which is called heave right so you have to have all these gyros and GPS and everything else to keep track of where you, the ship's attitude and position when you transmit and then as it comes back and of course this is constantly changing so you've got to correct for all that. So, well, how many seconds does it take for a sound beam to go up? Yeah. Down to the bottom of that? So, because it takes roughly 1,500 meters per second, if you were in the deepest part of the ocean, which is 10 to 11,000 meters, depending on how precise, we'll be a little bit sloppy here and say it's 12,000 because that's a nice multiple. So, if you got to go 12,000 meters down and you got to do 12,000 meters back up at 1,500 meters per second, that takes. Got to go 24,000 total meters at 1,500 meters per second, so it's, uh, so it's uh, roughly 18 seconds or 16, 16, yeah. So the deeper the water, the slower the ping, so you, like when you're trying to hit the rack at night, you can hear the ping. If it's going really fast, that means the water is really shallow because the sonar automatically adjusts itself so it gets as many pings as possible, but if the water is really, really deep, it's ping, <laughs> down, all the way back up. Ping. So you can almost, if you if you count at night, like you can almost figure out how deep the water is just by figuring, knowing that it sounds 1,500 meters per second. If you got 10 seconds, total distance was 15,000 meters, which means the water is seven and a half kilometers deep, or five miles. Do the um, do the computers use this an average set number, or the, do they use sort of like a depth integrated well, change that's, in, in yeah, sound that's, velocity? That's the fun part. We're going to go launch the. Uh, the rocket slash torpedo here in a little <laughs> bit and uh, what it does is it's it's a little torpedo like thing which actually trails wires off the back of it so you launch it off the back of the ship and it goes down and it measures the temperature and the pressure as it goes down and there's all these the equation of state of seawater is pretty well known uh -huh. so as they go down they can figure out what the speed of sound is right. as you go down and that doesn't in the deep ocean that doesn't change tremendously every day so typically once a day at noon they'll they'll shoot one of the XBTs off the back and then they'll measure the sound velocity profile and that's crucial to get the real good results that this thing can produce. So it doesn't use an average. No, it does not. It, it actually uses that profile. Right. And they have another way to get a profile. We have a CT plumber on the station. Right, we have a CTD. Yeah. yeah. So we'll get like super duper in principle if we wanted to sound velocity profiles, which is the SVP. And you'll sometimes you'll see these abbreviations like SVP. And uh, it's, it's, so there's lots of that. But you know, at a practical level, when you come out to do a sample, what you're going to mostly want to look at is not this status box with the flashing red light that says we should launch an XBT. What you want to look at is this little box here. And it's a little bit hard to read. There's lots of interesting data up here. Like it's going to tell you the uh, true sound velocity. And there's various modes. Like are we looking deep or shallow? And we'll talk about the ping numbers and stuff. And this display also says the same thing, it's delayed by a few seconds because this display takes a little bit longer and it's real-time computing. So this is the real-time display and the, the nice chart view is actually delayed by a second. So sometimes if you look carefully, you'll notice the position isn't exactly the same. But the key thought is there's a missing decimal point. So 
we are not really at 5,912 degrees south. We're at 59 degrees 0.12 south. And similarly, we're at 143.45 degrees east. Uh, the course over ground is 228. The speed over the ground is 15 knots, so right to second, we're moving right along. And the depth, the DPT, is 3974. So I just told you we're measuring a whole big swath of depths across the bottom. So if you're going to pick a number, which number would you pick? Straight underneath the ship. And that's typically called the center beam, although the center beam is rocking and rolling. It's, it boils down to the depth underneath the ship. So the fun part of this is typically when you get to look at this thing, let me move this out of the way. This is the part that's conceptually the easiest, and we'll talk about these in a second. So this is just like, you remember up in the mess hall, there's a map of New Zealand, and it shows the water depth. So this is exactly the same thing. It's color-coded. So the deepest water that we can see here is 36, I'm sorry, the shallow water is 3,600 meters, which is the better part of 10,000 feet. And then we've got the deepest is at 4,600 meters, which is you know, 12, 13,000 feet. So if you look at this, it was a little bit inter more interesting earlier. There was actually mountains and valleys. And you can see that there are mountains and valleys here and there's an occasional deep hole. But sometimes you have to be a little bit careful because uh, it could be just an instrument artifact because the ship's rolling around and you know anything can happen. We'll talk about the scalloped edges in a bit. But what you can basically see is because it's all pretty much shades of green, we're not going over the Grand Canyon. We're not going over the Rocky mm -hmm. Mountains. It's pretty much just the what they call an abyssal plane. Yeah. Yeah. So Jim is, would not get real upset if you probably <coughs> told him that it's the depth underneath the ship is 3974. If you wanted to give yourself a couple hundred meters slack, you might say, let's drop to 3700 true. And there doesn't seem to be anything around here except for this business here. That's a lot more shallow. And that's several miles away because you'll notice that these are two tenths of a degree. What's the rule of thumb? There's 60 nautical miles to a degree. So two tenths of a degree is about 12 miles. So that's a long ways away from where we're at. It's at least five, six miles away. But if you saw like a real complicated view, you might be concerned, but you always have to look at this color chart because it might say 4,000 to 4,001, just to exaggerate. And so even though it looks like there's a big complicated topography down there, the thing automatically scales to make a nice, look interesting picture. So always you gotta look at, at this. But generally, if the topography looks like this, and the range is pretty small. As you can see, it's all green here. So it's all right at 4,000 meters, and that kind of lines up with all that. Well, you said it auto scales. It does, huh? yeah. So uh, just to get into like a little detail, so how wide across is this thing? Well, they can actually steer this thing really wide. So they can actually steer the beam 60 degrees off on either side. So if you did some simple geometry, it's got to be the tangent of 60 degrees, right? Because we know the depth, and we know how far side we're off. So Tangent of 60 degrees is, you're going to be my go-to guy for the math here. Um, it's an easy number. Is it a half? No. It's square root of 2 over 2? Two? 2. <laughs> or 2. Okay. So we can measure out twice as wide in either direction as we're deep. So we're in 4,000 meters of water, so we can see sideways about 8,000 meters in either direction. And that's what this is telling you here. It's basically we're seeing, you know, on the order of 9 kilometers on either side of the ship. So here's the center line, roughly zero meters and we're going 9,000 meters or nine kilometers that way and we're going 11 kilometers that way. And this is a waterfall diagram. It's just another way to look at the same thing. It's like a wire surface. If you were to look at the topography, it's, the reason they call it a waterfall is it keeps drawing the, the pings in front of them. So every time it pings, you'll see another little trace go across the front. Uh, one thing that you want to do before you decide to drop a million dollar fish over the side is you'll want to see, is my signal quality pretty good? So if you see some strange things like a bunch of spikes in the middle and then it's all flat on the side, you might be a little bit concerned because you're only seeing a little bit out. There's 192 transducers. If only the first few center ones are working for whatever reason or if you got lousy signal, you probably definitely want to talk to Frank or Bud and see what's going on with the, with the system. This is simply a single beam that was a single ping and you can see how that looks as you go across the ship. So that's the most recent one of these. And that's maybe interesting, maybe not. It just, it allows you to see what each transducer is doing. Oh, hard. Getting old as hell. So <laughs> why would you care about that? When Gene and I were out here, the only other time I did this, when we went to the Galapagos, there was a barnacle growing on one of the transducers. So every single ping that came out of one of the transducers was wrong. So Uda and myself, 
who were like the people from the data center that were on the ship to deal with this stuff, we had to go through and every single ping, we had to delete that particular transducer's data because it was broken. But we didn't know that at the time. We were just kind of curious what's going on. So, you know, if you're pinging every 15 seconds, which is kind of the slowest that you would go if you're, if you're going to be pinging, every 15 seconds worth of data for a five-week cruise, we had to delete the data from transducer or whatever it was, let's just say 20. So that gets really tedious. So that's called ping editing. And if you're bad graduate students, you'll be forced to ping edit. <laughs> but typically, we won't do that on board. So what we're doing is continuously collecting the data in real time. And then for quality control, at some point, we'll, we'll pick an hour worth of data, and, and then we'll process it and look at it and just say, yeah, it looks like what we're seeing on the screen is lining up with what we're really measuring just to make sure nothing's broken. And then when we get to the shore, either the GDC or the shipboard computer group or somebody will turn this into a nice grid. If you want to know all the details about that, we could talk about that. But it's basically a lot of computer programming. And when it's all said and done, it ends up making a map like we see of New Zealand upstairs. Uh, I don't know if we're going to do the launch right this second or not. If you want to know why topography is interesting, to me anyway, some of the reasons are it turns out there's simple relationships between how deep the ocean is and how old the ocean floor is. So if you do geophysics, you can figure out in some ways what the kinematics and dynamics of the continents have been because as you get farther away from the spreading centers, the water gets deeper and you can figure out the age and how fast it's been spreading. You can also deduce if its spreading rate's been constant or not. And so if you know the rate of spreading as a function of time, you can integrate and get the positions and all this sort of thing. <clears throat> Another thing that's interesting is how rough the seafloor is, and this is my particular interest. If you got the, the tides cause the water to slosh around a little bit in the ocean, and when it hits the rough things on the bottom, it mixes. So there's this big experiment called HOME, which is the Hawaii Ocean Mixing Experiment. And if there's a sharp ridge, like the Hawaiian Islands, if you look at them on a topography map, or stick up just like a knife edge across the bottom of the ocean and the currents go sloshing across this and the, mixes up the water, creates turbulence as it goes by. So uh, the prevalent thinking in oceanography, physical oceanography, is that the water sloshing around from the tides and the currents and all this uh, mix up the ocean and that's involved with global warming because that's how fast the CO2 is going to be dispersed through the ocean in this business. Uh, my boss and I claim that actually that's not really the case because being geophysicists, we know more about topography. See, physical oceanographers assume a bathtub ocean, as we like to ridicule them. They assume that the ocean's got street sides and a flat bottom, just like a bathtub. Whereas geophysicists, we like all this little topography on the bottom. And it's a fact that the biggest, most common feature on the surface of the Earth is actually in the bottom of the ocean, and they're called abyssal hills. And as you go over these abyssal plains, these are the abyssal hills you see. They're typically a couple hundred meters high, and they're a couple kilometers wide, and that's about what we're seeing here. And the question is, if you're in a water column that's very stratified, then skipping all the fancy stuff about buoyancy frequency and everything, it's relatively simple to get slosh mode turned into radiating waves. And the waves radiate away the energy, and then when they run into other mountains and stuff, they dissipate. So our claim is actually the abyssal hills, because they're so prevalent, even though they're not very steep, are actually where a lot of the dissipation is coming from. And there's this huge debate that's been going on ever since 1967 when Walter Monk first came up with this about where does the tidal energy from the moon get dissipated in the ocean and is this why the oceans are stratified? And the big question with all this is, as you know, the Gulf Stream takes the water up north, the water cools off and it sinks, goes back to the equator, how does it get back up to the top? There has to be some source of energy to take the water back up to the top. What is that source of energy? And this is it's frequently called the diapicle mixing or diffusivity and it's basically the mixing and the question is you have to get a source of energy to get the water to come back up because the heavy water is at the bottom heavy sinks so it takes some source of energy to get the heavy water back up to the top and so uh, Walter Monk noticed that the amount of energy that it takes if you make reasonable order magnitude calculations and this is Walter's genius in my humble opinion is he can come up with the right order of magnitudes and come up with these interesting results one of the interesting results is the amount of energy, you can measure how far away the moon is and it's slowing down, and you can figure out, therefore, how much tidal dissipation from the moon is going on. And that happens to be almost exactly the right amount of energy to get the oceans to be stratified. So this started about a 40-year process, and everybody's trying to figure out where is this mixing going on. So you got Hawaii is up for grabs. Uh, uh, renegade geophysicists like myself are claiming abyssal hills. Uh, there's lots of different claims about where this is mixing up. Uh, 
You might think it might be the continental shelf, but the tides and currents go along the continental shelves rather than along them. So that's kind of a theory that's gone out of you know, favor, if you will. So that's why you might want to have a multi-beam sonar. Now, if you could, you'd drive this sonar over the whole ocean and you'd have a perfect map. And this thing is very accurate. We're talking, you know, a few meters. You'd have this 20 kilometer wide map of the whole wide world to a few meters accuracy. And then you can do all kinds of wonderful calculations. Problem is the ship costs twenty-five to fifty thousand dollars a day, and we're only covering ten knots. So you're getting a twenty, a twenty-kilometer wide slot, swap by a few kilometers per hour. So if you were going to drive a ship over the whole world, it would cost like a billion dollars to do that. So this is why people have got into all these other means, like using satellites to map the surface of the ocean. And we'll have a different lecture about how you could use gravity to measure how deep the ocean is. But so the, the good news is these are wonderful sonars. The bad news is they want to go as fast as the ship. And although t if you think about it, going twice as far as the depth of the ocean is pretty good coverage. If you have to cover the whole ocean, 70% of the whole wide world, it's going to take a long, long time. So, And one reason the system is on during this cruise, even though we don't need these data, is to collect them for other people. We don't actually, in our case, we don't actually pay for the processing. The Clivar program doesn't, but the data are made available to the groups to process. So uh, we understand the importance of it. Yeah. So, uh, and that's why, uh, if people ask my opinion, I always want to drive the ship someplace we haven't gone before because if we go the same place, we've got the same data, and that's interesting. But unlike water column, the topography doesn't really vary. I mean. The sonar might have a bug in it or something, but once you measure what the features of the bottom of the ocean are, you're pretty well done. So it's nice to take a different swap. You know, if you took a different time, every every time you went to the Antarctic, you took a slightly different path. You could get this kind of fine network of, across the bottom of the ocean, and then I could do my Fourier transform calculations. You like 60 cell. What do you think about 62 cell? People have gone there before for uh -huh. the obvious reason that it's not as rough. So, so 60 you, or 59 would have been better, but, you know. Yeah, but if you talk to the captain. Well, you know, there's there's other issues too. Like a, a perfect world for me would have been straight south to 60 or 59 and straight west. But as we learned in geometry class, that's like the long way to get from point A to point B because it's going the sides of the triangle instead of the hypotenuse. So the captain doesn't want to spend six or seven extra days at fifty thousand dollars a day to get us to the same place. So that's that's what's going on with that. It's just that easy. And mostly people don't want to you know be out in the raging 60s. You know, getting tossed about, it'd be just as convenient to go south, maybe see icebergs and, you know, whatnot also. So, there's a lot going on, but in a perfect world, every time the ship went someplace, we'd go a little bit different path, and then we'd slowly but surely build up a map of the bottom of the ocean. And... So now you run about oh, go ahead with the question. Do, uh, do these systems get placed on commercial shipping vessels ever? Do uh, you know, because they're there's going along those lines. There's a deal called uh, Sea Keepers, and uh, wealthy individuals that have their own private yachts uh, volunteer to have one of these 100,000 or million dollar systems put on their yacht so that when they go fishing off Bermuda or wherever they're going, they actually collect data and then they give it to the scientists. And, uh, yeah, well, that's it, it's a tax write off. And we don't want to discourage people from doing that, but it's a pretty expensive process, so your average fishing boat doesn't actually have a, a nice multi beam. The oil companies use this quite a bit because there's certain typical patterns that we don't need to get into about where oil would be found. And so the Gulf of Mexico has been mapped to a fairly well. And there's what they call survey boats that do nothing more than just have one of these nice sonars and go out and just what they call mow the lawn. They just go back and forth and back and forth and they just measure the whole thing. They also do this in the, what they call the EEZ, which is the economic, exclusive economic zone. And people want to know where all the features in the areas that they control the water. That way they can see if, if there happens to be gold or oil or whatever, they've, they've got it all mapped out and nice. And sometimes, I guess uh, Bud was telling us, there's interesting cases where there's reefs that are sufficiently solid that somebody can stand up on them even if they're underwater. And then you can claim that it's your dirt. And so Fiji wants wanted to know where these reefs are so that they can claim them as part of their territory. Is if you get 200 kilometers or 200 nautical miles around any dirt that's yours, you can, in principle, get this very, you know, large exclusive economic interest zone, which gives you all the fishing rights. So that's the long and short of that. And so the main thing I think for us to watch is if we're going to be watch standards and samplers, you'll definitely want to look at this little gray box right here, so you can 
figure out how deep the water is and that's the depth directly underneath the ship and that's probably the key and then keep an eye on this uh, chart view here so you can just see are there sea mounts is it like wild topography you can see some pretty wild under because this is like the surface of the earth you know you might be over the rocky mountains or you might be over nebraska just depends we're over nebraska right at the minute but. so that's that and so to get the speed of sound what as a function of depth which is the key thought uh, we're going to go do this, we're, we're going to launch this rocket here shortly. <laughs> I don't know, who will we get to launch the rocket? But Gino help us out with that, and I guess what we'll mostly need are uh, warm clothes and something so you don't get wet. And I don't know where we keep our safety harnesses, or maybe we won't all go out there, maybe some of us will watch on TV. So. Or you can go up here on the, on the winch deck. Yeah, we can go on the winch deck, too. So, I don't know who wants to volunteer to launch the... Uh, the XVT. Done this, done there, done that. I've already got a little recoil. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> it, it can be a little intense, so you probably want to get a couple people to like, yeah, you know, hold cool. on to people so you don't get blown over. Torpedo, and it's it's like, uh, it is like a rocket in the sense that, you know, like when the military launches these guided rockets that they can actually steer around, mm -hmm. those rockets in the old days used to trail wires that come out, and so they can send the signal. There you go. Can I open this up or not? Well, it, this is a real one. Yeah. Yeah, that's a new one. Yeah, okay. Let's see if we can find the wires on it. But... All right. But the basic idea is it looks like a torpedo and wires come off the end and it goes back up into the ship and what the radar or sonar is telling us right now is we're overdue to drop one of these over the side and get the velocity profile. So we want to get an SVP. And this will measure it as we go down the side. There you go. So there's the spool of wire. There's actually two spools of wire. There's a spool of wire in, in the little probe. And that is to deploy as from once it goes to the water straight down. This coil of wire is in the back of the uh, canister. And this deploys from the point where it, it enters the water, trailing back to the ship. And the whole idea is to minimize the drag that's on this little probe right here. Now, you see this, this is, it looks like a little single wire. And um, in my youth, I used to be able to peel them apart, but it's actually two separate wires that are separated by a, a varnish insulator. So basically you have a, uh, a measured voltage going down the wire, it goes into the probe, and at the bottom of the probe is a thermistor. A thermistor is just a little metal, that, piece of metal, that changes the resistance as it gets colder or warmer or whatever. So one wire is conducting a, a, a known voltage, and up the other wire, after it goes through this thermistor, uh, the voltage has been changed, and the computer changes that into a temperature. So it's this, uh, they know this free falls at a certain rate, and it almost hits maximum velocity as soon as it goes into the water. Uh, that's how they compute um, temperature versus depth. Thousand dollars a piece, roughly. Five hundred? Mm, no, actually, just the regular. Uh, it depends. Uh, you can get really elaborate. You can get ones that now have salinity. These are ah. just temperature, and I think they're one hundred and seventy-five oh, right. a piece. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and it depends four, too. Then a four hundred or an eight hundred. Yeah, it, it depends too. These can be the these can be dropped out of airplanes. So they're the ones that dropped out of airplanes obviously are much bigger because they have uh, more. Uh, uh, wire in them, but uh, we run this see from I think 400 meters to 1500 meters. There's a range. There's also a speed range too. That uh, so that has to be uh, considered how fast the ship is moving and how deep you want to go as to which probe type that you use. So how do, how do you, how deep do these probes go in the water? I think these are deep blues. I think they're good for 1500 meters. So then do you assume? Then you assume a constant That's sound right. velocity after that? Right. Yeah. It, the, okay. the properties of the ocean are kind of exponential at, in the abyss. In the upper, so it's the upper ocean is where the, right. the biggest changes in sound velocities. Are. And that's why the Argo drifters don't necessarily go real deep outside of technical issues is there's not a lot. Once you get down to 2,000 meters, you're below the thermal line. Yeah. Yeah. And it's fairly constant. I mean, it's not exactly, but... But we wouldn't be here if it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but for the purposes of doing sonar, it's pretty, pretty good.